Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Well, good morning. Today, as we continue our series in Genesis 1 through 11, we'll be examining chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. So I invite you to open your Bibles to that passage. Before we delve into it, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're told in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that uh, all scripture is inspired by you and that it's useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness that the person dedicated to you may be capable and equipped for every good work. And Lord, with that in mind, I pray that as we, as we examine this passage in Genesis 2 together this morning, that we would regard it as inspired, as you say in 2 Timothy, and that it would do that kind of work in our lives, reprove and correct us. And that uh, I pray that we would apply it to our daily lives so that we might be more conformed to the image of your son, in whose, Jesus, whose name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We've all heard the expression, I'm sure, a marriage made in heaven. But does such an animal really exist? Is there such a thing as a perfect marriage? Probably not. <laughs> However, there was a time, a marriage that was, in fact, actually made in paradise. Last week, during our time together in Genesis 2, particularly verses 4 through 17, we were introduced to the Garden of Eden, which in Hebrew literally means delight or paradise. And in the text we'll be examining today, we're given the details of the very first wedding which took place in Eden, that is, paradise. And when this wedding took place, it was a time when there was no sin in the world. Everything was perfect. The marriage rate was 100%, the divorce rate was 0%. Then as we'll see later, in Genesis chapter three, the fall of man occurred and sin entered the world. And with sin came all the problems and wretchedness of the curse. And with these, problems came trouble at home. One would spend a long time seeking the perfect marriage. Of course, there are many who claim today that they never speak a harsh word. Well, if, if they say that, either they're screaming too loud for the words to be coherent, or they're just plain liars. The truth is, many cases, in many cases, marriage resembles a battlefield more than it does a union of two lovers. Consider these facts. According to a 2008 study by the Barna Group, among those who have said their wedding vows, one out of three have been divorced at least once. According to a recent article by Forbes Advisor Group, 50% of all first-time marriages end in divorce. And those who wed multiple times face a far higher rate of divorce. In fact, 67% of second marriages end, and 73% of third marriages are dissolved by divorce. Some new statistics, however, are now indicating that within the last few years, the divorce rate in America has actually been in decline. Is this because people are developing better social skills and learning how to communicate and work through their problems more effectively? I don't think so. More people today are just, a higher percentage of people are just not getting married and they're living together instead. But either way, it's a far cry from what the Lord intended. Well, today, in our study of creation, we've come to that glorious moment when God created woman. As we look into the latter part of Genesis chapter 2, we'll see God's intentions concerning marriage and his goals for the first married couple, Adam and Eve. And the principles taught here will go a long way in helping us divorce-proof our marriages. 
And as we look into the text, we'll see for ourselves what makes a marriage made in paradise. In Genesis 2, 18 through 25, we'll examine three vitally related things. And we begin with the purpose God had in creating woman. In verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a companion for him who co corresponds to him. The first purpose God had in creating woman was to explain the basic need of every person. Again, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. In Genesis 1, there are six joyous refrains marked by the words, and God saw that it was good, from verses 4 through 25. And these were capped off by a seventh refrain, the last verse, verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So with that leading into chapter 2, we're a little unprepared for what God says here, particularly in verse 18. It is not good. Now this doesn't mean that God had made up to this point that something God made was not good. God means that so far there was, there was a deficiency or an absence of something that man needed. At this point, Adam had no idea that it was not good to be alone. The observation and declaration of Adam's need was all that of God. You see, God did not consult Adam. God was not responding to a complaint by Adam. Not good was God's sovereign assessment as the creator of the universe. God knew something that Adam did not know, and that is that God had created Adam to be a sociable being. Adam, you see, could not be happy by himself. Adam needs, needed someone to interact with and, and to love and to share his faith, his life with. You see, friends, man was never made or intended to function alone. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And this just isn't related to marriage, but every situation in life. It's better not to be alone than to be alone. Proverbs 18.1 says, one who isolates himself pursues selfish desires. He rejects all sound judgment. Our world is creating the false impression that it's better if we isolate and insulate ourselves. But the Bible says that kind of attitude is wrong. It's self-centered. And as Proverbs 18 says, it rejects all sound judgment. Notice, if you will, before we go any further, that it is proclaimed before the command to have children. See, God's creation of marriage was met, uh, to meet the need for companionship long before children. The basic issue is friendship, not procreation. How many of you remember the first Rocky movie? Well, there have actually been nine of them, six focusing on Rocky Balboa and three centered on Adonis Creed. In the very first film about the boxer named, nicknamed the Italian Stallion, Rocky Balboa, if you recall, he falls madly in love with a very demure Adrian, who works at a tropical fish pet store. And of course, Adrian is very intelligent, shy, and cautious. Rocky, well, he's none of those things. In one scene, Adrian's brother, Polly, asks Rocky what he sees in his sister. And Rocky answers, she's got gaps, I got gaps. Together, we feel gaps. Well, later in Rocky II, Rocky marries Adrian, who convinces him to make a life outside of boxing. And she later slips into a coma after giving birth to their firstborn son. And when Adrian comes out of her coma, she promises her full support for Rocky in his quest for a rematch with the world heavyweight champion Apollo Creed, whom he previously lost to in his 15-round split decision. And the rematch goes the full 15 rounds again with both Rocky and Creed falling to the canvas after Rocky lands a succession of punches. And as the referee exercises his 10 count to the limit, both Creed and Rocky struggle to get back up. And Creed falls back down in exhaustion. But Rocky's able to get back up from sheer determination 
beating the 10 count and winning the rematch by a knockout, thus becoming heavyweight champion of the world. And when the media moves in to interview Rocky after the fight, he just says, I just want to say one thing to my wife who's home. Yo, Adrian, I did it. <laughs> you know, Rocky could not have accomplished his victory without the support he received from his wife, Adrian. She truly filled his gaps, as we'll see that Eve also did for Adam. And this is one of the benefits of marriage. The husband and the wife complement each other. Men are left brain creatures. We like to analyze things and come to conclusions about stuff. We like to figure things out. I mean, we just call it like it is and never for one minute try to see any other side of the story. If we go back to look at something from a right-brained approach, we have to stop using the left side of the brain and we're left without any reasoning ability whatsoever. On the other hand, women have been gifted by God to use both sides of their brain simultaneously. See, they can see both sides of the coin at the same time. That's a fact that makes them very helpful in figuring out things. But also, as a man, a little frustrating to live with. You know, if there were only men, there would be little compassion, little understanding, and little caring. Women make up that which we too often lack. And when they come along with their right brains firing on all cylinders and point out how narrow we are and what we are refusing to see, it becomes clear that they have made us complete and given us an insight that we otherwise would never have had. Well, God's second purpose in creating woman was to establish the motivation behind all male and female relationships. If you notice, the word order of this text is extremely important. It isn't until later in verse 24 that God says this is why a man leaves his father and mother and unites with his wife and they become one flesh or, or one family. Marriage must be vitally related to in intimate companionship and friendship. But all that precedes verse 24 applies to everyone whether they're married or not. We were intended by God to relate to each other and the motivation behind all human relationships would be that of being a helper, a servant, a companion. And that goes for men as well as women. Notice verse 18 again. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. That English word, helper, that can connote many different ideas. So it may not be the best word to accurately convey the meaning of the Hebrew word, Ezer, from which it's translated. The usage of this Hebrew term does not suggest a subordinate role, like our English word helper often does. You know, in the Bible, even God is frequently described as the helper, the one who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, the one who meets our needs. In this context, then, the word seems to express the idea of an indispensable companion. The woman saw, or the woman would supply what the man was lacking in the design of creation, and logically it would follow that the man would supply that which we, she was lacking. Again, as Rocky Balboa said, she's got gaps, I've got gaps. Together we fill gaps. Well, in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, we can see the impact of this need for companionship in terms not just of marriage, but of friendship, particularly within the body of Christ, the church, we cannot live isolated from everyone else in the world. Two people are better than one, is what God's word says. So we need to be accountable to each other, and we need to have friendships. The principles that govern these relationships also govern marriage. By the way, lest anyone who is single should get the wrong idea, it's not always God's will for everyone to be married. The Apostle Paul made this clear in 1 Corinthians 7, 7. You know, there are times and circumstances when God has determined that he can more effectively use someone when they're unattached and single. As he brings out, uh, Paul mentions that in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 and 33. Therefore, instead of being upset with the Lord and doing everything in one's power to attract a mate, perhaps the correct response would be to realize that the Lord might have a better plan. 
than that for one's life. As we move on then to verses 19 through 23, we see the process God used to create woman. Notice what we're told. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the air, and to every wild animal. But for Adam, no companion who corresponded to him was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was asleep, God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, in analyzing this process, I think we can make three observations. First, God's original plan was deeply impressed upon Adam by the task of naming the animals. We see that in verses 19 and 20. How would God get his point across to this marvelous creation called man? By assigning him the task of naming the animals. You know, you would think that following verse 18, where God had just said it's not good for the man to be alone, I'll make a companion for him to correspond to him, you would think that the very next verse would say that God then created woman. But that's not so, is it? Instead, God gave Adam the task of naming all the animals. Why? God was preparing Adam to honor and value his future companion. God was, in a sense, preparing Adam for marriage. He was teaching him to be a leader. You know, the power to name is the power of, of authority. So God was teaching Adam to be a leader. God was also teaching and training Adam to be a lover. God brought all the animals to Adam in pairs to be named, male and female. Each had a counterpart. But in all of creation, Adam found no counterpart for himself. God was creating in Adam, then, you see, a gnawing hunger for a life partner. Naming the pairs of animals was, in a sense, Adam's premarital counseling session. And in God's wonderful wisdom, he used a simple process to show Adam his need for companionship. You know, one question that often arises when it comes to naming, Adam naming the animals is, how could he, Adam have had enough time to name all the animals and still have, leave plenty of time for the creation of Eve on day six? Well, it's helpful to remember that uh, Genesis 2.20 says that Adam gave names to all the livestock, or cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every wild beast, or beast of the field. So this did not involve naming sea creatures or creeping things. Also, all cattle and every beast of the field may not mean the same thing as every beast of the earth, which is mentioned earlier in chapter 1. It was probably a smaller set that represented all types of beasts of the earth. Adam only named the animals that God brought to him, and besides, he had most of the day to do it. Before the fall, you see, as well, Adam's brain was perfect. So he didn't have many distractions. He shouldn't have any problems coming up with names. It's been estimated by some that only a few hours would be needed to name the animals. Well, the second observation we can make in regard to the process God used to create woman is that God's creative power was demonstrated in a unique way so that humanity would understand the relationship that God intended between male and female. It was distinctly and uniquely demonstrated to Adam, as you notice indicated in verses 21 and 22. Notice here, God caused a deep sleep to come over Adam. Secondly, God took one of his ribs, or part of Adam's side. Thirdly, God made or fashioned the rib into a woman. And fourth, God brought the finished product to the man. You know, another question that is often asked at this point is, you know, since God took a rib from Adam to make Eve, does that mean that men have one less rib than women? 
I'm like, ministry called God Questions. God Questions Ministries respond to this question in this way. It says, they say, it's a wrong assumption, of course. Ribs are easily counted, and when men and women have the same number of them. God made a surgical change to Adam, not a genetic change. Performing surgery does not alter one's genetic makeup. Every descendant of Adam has the DNA encoding that produces 12 pairs of ribs, or 24 ribs total in the rib cage. Adam's sons all have the same number of ribs that Adam had originally. In the same way, the son of a kidney donor will have two kidneys, not just one. And the daughter of an amputee will not be born missing a limb. The fact that God pulled a rib out of Adam and not some other piece of his body shows God's wisdom, planning, and foresight. Ribs regrow. All bones in the human body are able to mend themselves, but rib bone is unique in that it can regenerate. When a surgeon performs a costectomy, or the removal of part or all of a rib, he or she will be careful to leave the perichondrium, or the membrane surrounding the rib. The rib taken can be used for bone grafts elsewhere in the body, and the spot of the missing rib will grow a new rib, usually within one or two months. Given the rib's ability to regenerate, we know that Adam, or that God, did not permanently wound Adam when he took a rib from his side to make Eve. Adam did not live the rest of his life with a defect or a weak spot in his skeletal thorax. Because of God's wonderful design, Adam lived out the rest of his days with the same number of ribs that he had been created with. So the process in creating Eve from Adam's rib was carried out from God from beginning to end. Woman thus was a unique creation as a product from the hand of God. In no way was she inferior to the man or simply an afterthought. The late 17th and eight, early 18th century British, British minister, Matthew Henry, and he's known best for his six-volume Bible commentary, he said, quote, Eve was not taken out of Adam's head to top him, neither out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved by him. God uniquely fashioned a uh, woman and brought her to the man. A rather unfortunate yet common belief in some Christian circles is that since God made Eve as a helper for Adam, women are somehow less valuable than men. In fact, people frequently compare women to the Holy Spirit in his role of helper because he's the member of the Trinity who does a substantial amount of work but he gets very little recognition. His ministry is to glorify uh, the Son. He's a member of the Trinity who has, does a substantial amount of work, but as we're told in John 14, 26, he gets very little recognition. He's referred to there as the helper, or parakletos in the Greek. But if we examine the original Hebrew word used for helper, it's, it's rather enlightening in, here in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, 18 and 20, the Hebrew words often translated in our English versions as a helper corresponding to him, they're important to examine because they're uniquely powerful within the story of creation. The words are azer and konegdo. The word azer occurs 21 times in the Old Testament, with only two of those 21 times referring to the first woman. Three times it describes nations to whom Israel appeals for military help. And most significantly, 16 times it refers to God himself as the helper of his people. The word konegdo was added to azer here in Genesis 2 to distinguish the woman as a helper corresponding to man. And that word konegdo draws its, from its literal definition, which is before your face or within your view or purpose, and it can also be translated as a counterpart to or corresponding to. You know, through a careful look at the original language, it's easy to determine that Eve's role was not then confined to subservience or maidservants, or even that of simply playing a supportive role. 
In the original language of Scripture, Israel is a strong, visible help comparable to that provided by God the Father. And applying that to us in today's culture, a note, a note to all you guys, note to self especially, I'll hear it from my wife. God did not say, I will create for him a helper, someone who does the housework, while the man of the house sits in his soft recliner with the remote control in his hands, flipping from one channel to another. Nor does it mean that man has the right to boss his wife around because he's superior to her. She too was created in the image of God, and, he, uh, and she is man's equal. A well, third observation we could draw in relation to the process God used to create woman is that his divine purpose was revealed in the very response of Adam to what God had created. In verse 23, you notice Adam said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Can you imagine Adam, Adam's response when he woke up and never having seen another human being, saw the woman that God had created expressly for him. No doubt he was very excited. He saw himself and recognized that she was taken out of man. It's interesting that uh, back in May, the University of Texas was suggesting on social media a new spelling of the word women so that its students and faculty could avoid the, using the word ending in Men, M-E-N. According to University of Texas, this was considered empowering. The university suggested various writing uh, of the word women, including women, uh, W-I-M-M-I-N, Wamyan, W-O-M-Y-N, and Wamson, W-O-M-X-N. And explained that the new spelling was a positive step toward empowering feminists and, and people who dislike adding a masculine preview inside the word that totally refers to females. You see, from their perspective, the proposal of a new spelling of women was in part to show that these other three terms spelled differently are, are not the extension of men, as hinted by the classic biblical story of Adam and Eve. Well, apparently, they had very little regard for the derivation of the word woman. It came from what we're told here in Genesis 3, 20, or 2, 23, by Adam. Adam's statement, you see, was actually a verbal acknowledgement of interdependency that God built into marriage and applied not only to a physical relationship, but to a personal responsibility that he immediately felt upon waking up to see for the first time the woman that God had fashioned from the rib that he removed from Adam's own body. It's similar to what the Apostle Paul had in mind when he wrote in Ephesians 5.28, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. You see, marriage is the only relationship in life where Two are one, in a sense, not just two. Moving on to verses 24 and 25, we see the principles God established for marriage. It says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Here we see that marriage was instituted by God. It's the second of Eden's two divine institutions, the first being the Sabbath, as we saw earlier in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2. And here we're told in verses 25, 24 and 25 that there are at least three things that God intended to be the basic principles for all marriages. The therefore, or this is why, leading off of verse 24, it's predicated in what we're already been told in verses 18 through 23. First, there's the principle of marital fidelity or faithfulness. The text says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife. If you have the King James Version, you see that the verbs are leaving and cleaving. It's a protection of the friendship that will now enjoy physical fulfillment. 
And to engage in this type of relationship with someone else destroys the original, the original purpose of God. See, adultery is the quickest way to ruin a friendship in marriage. How binding is this solitary commitment? Well, the Bible says it lasts until death. Secondly, there's the principle of physical intimacy. It says, and they became, and they become one flesh or, or one family. So there's, we could say there's leaving, cleaving, and weaving. The Hebrew word for flesh here is basar, and it refers to more than just a, a physical relationship. The man and his wife bring into being a new family unit. And the phrase one flesh occurs only here, and it's interpreted in light of previous verse 23, where the man declared the woman was bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. You see, to be one's bone and flesh is to be related by blood to someone. For example, the phrase describes the relationship between Laban and Jacob later in Genesis 29, verse 14. The expression one flesh seems to indicate that they became, as it were, kin, at least legally. A new family unit was created, or metaphorically. In this first marriage in human history, the woman was literally formed from the man's bone and flesh. The first marriage sets the pattern for how later marriages are to be understood. And out of the physical union with any marriage comes a joining of two hearts, two minds, two bodies. Two personalities until they're so intertwined that it's hard to know where one ends and the other begins. And as couples live together for a long time, they begin to act alike and sound alike and, in a sense, even look alike. They even begin to think alike. You know, a healthy marriage is the work of a lifetime. God has ordained a good marriage, that a good marriage gets better with age. It never applies to anyone except those who are married. And it involves three things. First of all, it involves God's approval. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage must be respected by all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled, because God will judge immoral people and adulterers. So God approves of physical intimacy only within marriage. In terms of God's approval, marriage must also be understood biblically as being heterosexual in nature. The mate whom God created for Adam, a male, was Eve, a female. In spite of the persistence with which the, the gay liberation movement argues for the legitimizing of homosexuality, its ca case cannot stand in light of biblical revelation. You know, if God had intended marriages to be heter uh, homosexual, Genesis 2 would some, say something about Adam and Steve, not just Adam and Eve. The first marriage that God performed is quite clearly a pattern. And those who attempt to mount a biblical case for homosexuality must completely abandon reasonable hermeneutics or principles of biblical interpretation. Secondly, it involves our satisfaction and enjoyment. In Proverbs 5, Solomon encourages his sons in the area of moral purity by advising them to have their physical needs met exclusively by their own wife. In verses 18 and 19, Solomon writes, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife you married in your youth. May you be captivated by her love always. You know, many married couples today do not enjoy their, their physical intimacy because not because of some physical problem, but because they're not best friends. Thirdly, it involves our responsibility. You know, marriage is the only God-ordained context for physical intimacy. And as such, marriage is to be monogamous. God gave Adam just one wife. And then, of course, the Old Testament, if you're familiar with it, it reports many polygamous relationships. But the Lord Jesus reminds us in Matthew 19.8 that as he said, from the beginning, it was not so. And third, there's the principle of complete intimacy. You know, as verse 25 says, the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. This involved transparency in which they had nothing to hide. 
Hebrews 4.13 says, No creature is hidden from God, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, then, can we have complete intimacy when we don't have complete transparency? See, marriages that are alive and exciting are marriages that are transparent. Also, it involved purity, in which there was no reason to be ashamed. The Apostle John writes about this in 1 John 2, 28 through 3, 3. Don't have the time to read it now, but apart from this kind of purity, along with transparency, there can be no meaningful intimacy within marriage or genuine friendship outside of marriage. Well, as we bring this to a close, let's consider some questions for personal reflection or application. First of all, Let's ask ourselves, how might a person's view of marriage and or physical intimacy be affected if they don't believe this account is true? Secondly, what did Adam's work of naming the animals reveal about his relationship to them and about his need? Thirdly, what was Adam's response to the creation and presentation of Eve? What does this indicate concerning marriage relationships today? Number four, how does one's view of Scripture, particularly this account, affect one's view of marriage and sex? And finally, what observations can I make about God's model for marriage as seen in the relationship between Adam and Eve? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this record of your account of creating woman. Thank you, Father, for the fact that uh, you have established marriage as an institution that you ordained and father we acknowledge the fact that it's been wounded by the the fall that we're all in a sense a part of we were in adam as we're told in in romans when he sinned father help us to reclaim these truths about your institution of marriage from the beginning help us as husbands and wives to be transparent with each other and fulfill each other's needs and to father help us to communicate these truths to our children we thank you father that uh, you have designed us so that we as we saw earlier we can fill each other's gaps father help us as we go along this week may we who are married grow in our marriage relationships and uh, Help us to serve you as we have seen here. In Jesus' name, amen.